This week I read that one of the things that will keep evangelicals in the sight of persecution is our insistence on the exclusivity of the gospel. The Bible says there is one gospel. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. There's one gospel. It comes from God Almighty, and it is life-changing. But there aren't many. There's just one. The gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul's letter to the Galatian believers is proof that this problem, which plagues so many of today's Christians, is as old as the first century church. Many of you, like me, perhaps grew up in a church where you were considered to be a good Christian based upon your ability to live up to a certain number of things. And I don't have to give you what they are. They were different for everyone. But you were judged on the basis of your ability to do certain things and often not do certain other things. We call that legalism because it's a return to the law. Well, the Galatian letter was written to a group of Christians who were about ready to return to the bondage of the law. Let me tell you their story quickly. Had it not been for Paul's intervention in their lives through this letter called Galatians, many of them would have gone back to a dreary, dull legalism lived at its lowest level. You see, many Gentiles had come to be Christians during the time that Paul was preaching. Toward the end of his preaching career, Paul was reaching hundreds and hundreds of Gentiles with the gospel. But just as these Gentile Christians were getting established in the freedom of their faith, some teachers that Paul refers to as Judaizers in this text came from Jerusalem and began to teach these Gentiles that their faith wasn't complete unless it was accompanied by the law. In other words, they said, you want to believe in Jesus Christ, that's fine. But you can't have full salvation unless you add to it the observance of the Old Testament law. And especially at stake was the practice of circumcision, which was the Jewish rite. So they were trying to tell the Gentiles that really in order for them to be Christians, they had to be Jews too. And the attack was powerful against these new believers. It wasn't really original, but it was powerful. You know, from the very beginning, there always have been attacks on the gospel. Let me tell you how they come. They come in two different ways. First of all, sometimes people come and they try to subtract stuff from the gospel. Have you noticed? Well, I believe in the gospel. I just don't believe in the deity of Jesus. How do you do that? Oh, yes, I believe in the gospel, but I don't accept the Bible as the authoritative word of God. It's full of errors and it's not true. My friends, you can't do that. You can't take the gospel and pull out of it the stuff you don't like and still have the gospel. What you got is nothing. And over the years, we've been able to see that process, and we've identified it. When people start to denigrate the deity of Christ, we stand up against it. We teach against it. But the new thing in the world today is not the subtraction from the gospel. It's the addition to the gospel. The new thing is to take the gospel, leave it as it is, but add more stuff to it, like... If you're not baptized, you can't be a Christian. You ought to know, we believe in baptism here. We baptize somebody in almost every service, but we don't baptize them so that they can become Christians. We baptize them because they already are Christians. And baptism is a picture of what has already happened to them. Let me say this clearly. You don't have to be baptized to go to heaven. And I know that for a fact because the thief on the cross went right into the presence of the Lord and they didn't have time to baptize him. So baptism is an ordinance, but it's not a work of grace. Some people say, well, you can't have the gospel if you don't have the Eucharist. Well, the Eucharist may be all right, but it's not the gospel. Communion's not the gospel. The law is not the gospel. Giving food to the hungry is not the gospel. Helping people who are poor is important as it is. It is not the gospel. It is the result of the gospel at work in your life. But it isn't the gospel. And friends, when we start tampering with the gospel, we do great damage to the cause of Christ. Let's get this clear, that the gospel isn't anything other than what the Bible says it is. And Paul's going to deal with that here in this passage of Scripture. Now he begins where he had to begin because one of the things that was happening to him as this book starts is that people had begun to criticize Paul. They didn't have anything good to say that they could use against 
the message of grace and they didn't like Paul so they said well you can't trust Paul he's not even a real apostle he was born after the other apostles were gone he's not one of the twelve and so listen how Paul begins the letter he says Paul an apostle not from men or through man but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead Paul has to go after this accusation against him that he's not a real apostle because here they're not trying to discredit him as an apostle for any other reason than to be able to discredit his message if Paul is an apostle then he can say what he says but if he's not then you don't have to believe anything that he's taught so they went after Paul's apostleship and Paul begins this letter by dealing with the fact that he is a true messenger of God he is an apostle not from men or through men but through Jesus Christ his defense of his apostleship isn't a matter of pride he's not trying to say well I'm an apostle no his defense is born out of a deep concern for the gospel which he preached in other words if he is not God's apostle then the Galatians can disregard anything he might say so from the outset Paul wants it understood that as a true messenger his gospel is not from men but it's from God and of course it was true that Paul wasn't one of the twelve but his call was just as real as theirs had been in first Corinthians 15 he says and last of all he was seen by me Paul's writing me also as one born out of due time for I am the least of the apostles who am not worthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of Christ what is Paul saying am I not an apostle absolutely did he see Christ that was one of the requirements when did he see him on the road to Damascus he saw Christ after all of the rest he was born out of due time one of the other requirements for an apostle was they had to have received a message directly from God did Paul receive such a message look at verse 11 but I make known to you brethren that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man where did he get it he got it from God Paul was an apostle he was a legitimate apostle of Jesus Christ now probably you've noticed that some people today say they're apostles and if by their claim they mean that they are sent ones which is what the word means then that's okay but if they think they are apostles like the same apostles in the New Testament they are certainly in error because according to the New Testament you cannot be an apostle unless you saw the risen Lord unless you accompany Jesus from his baptism to his resurrection nobody today can say that but Paul said it and it was true of Paul an apostle born out of due time had every right to say what he was about to say now Paul is defending his own legitimacy his own credibility for if he is not credible then the rest of this is meaningless we now understand that Paul accepts his apostleship from God not from men he is appointed by God as an apostle and so he moves from his defense of the true messenger to talk about the true message and here's what he says about the true message of the gospel grace to you and peace from God verse 3 our Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil age according to the will of our God and Father to whom be glory forever and ever now that he has dealt with his own credibility Paul turns his attention to the content of the message of the gospel by the way you can't see my Bible but it's all marked up in this first chapter one of the reasons is this is all about the gospel the word gospel is in the first 11 verses five times Paul is talking about the gospel and what it really is and he wants us to understand the nature of it and now he's going to define it in these verses and what does he say about the gospel he said first of all it is the voluntary death of Christ on the cross for our sin by his own will he says he went to the cross how many of you know Jesus didn't go to the cross because he was made to go to the cross he went to the cross of his own will when he came into this world he prayed this prayer he said Lord in the volume of the book it is written I have come to do your will he went to the cross as the will of the Father by his own volition Paul says the first thing to remember about the gospel it is the voluntary death of Christ on the cross and then it says it's the vicarious death of Christ the word vicarious means to do something in behalf of another person to do something in someone else's place Paul says that he died Christ died for our sins for yours and for mine he died in the place where we deserve to die he was our vicarious substitute on the cross his death is voluntary 
His death is vicarious, and thirdly, it's victorious. Notice what he says happens when he dies for us. He delivers us from the evil age in which we live. We have been delivered because of what Jesus did on the cross. That's the gospel. If you go back to verse 1, it involves the resurrection. God the Father who raised him from the dead. So what is the gospel class? It's simply this. Christ died. Christ was buried. Christ rose again. His death was in our behalf as the Son of God. It was the propitiation for all the sin of the world. And whoever will put their trust in what Jesus did on the cross will become a Christian. That's what it means to be a Christian. That's the gospel. Not anything added to it, not anything subtracted from it. It's the pure gospel of the grace of God. Now, since Christ has done all of this for us, since he voluntarily has given himself for us, taking our place in death, rescuing us out of this evil age, how presumptuous it must seem to him, to God, when we try to add something human into what he's already done. It's like we're saying, God, thank you for the gospel, but it's not quite enough. Thank you for the gospel, but I'm not going to be able to accept this gospel unless I can add something to it from myself. The gospel is either God's gospel or it's no gospel. And Paul is saying, you can't say to these new Galatian believers, you have been saved by the grace of God, and the gospel is sufficient for you, oh, but you need the law too. And it was the very thing that they were doing that so angered Paul. I need to tell you, we're going to find this out before we're done. This is a violent passage of scripture. I mean, Paul is exercised in this passage of scripture, more so than you've ever seen your pastor exercised in this pulpit. To put it mildly, the boy's upset. <laughs> and he's upset for a legitimate reason. It's because the Gentile churches were being taught that what Jesus did through his death on the cross was not enough. It may have been adequate for their initial salvation, but they needed something more in order to maintain their Christian life. Paul says something, turn in your Bibles over to the third chapter. We, I just want to read the first three verses of the third chapter. Listen how Paul deals with this. He says, listen, he says, O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth? Now watch this. Before whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed among you as crucified. This only, he says, here's the question I want to ask you. Listen up. He said, I just want to know this. Did you receive the spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Are you so foolish? having begun in the spirit that you can now be made perfect in the flesh? You who think I'm saved by grace, but I got to keep myself saved and walking with God by my own works. Paul said, are you so foolish to think that you can keep yourself in a situation you can never get yourself into in the first place? How foolish is that? You cannot be saved without the grace of God, and you cannot live the Christian life without the grace of God. There's nobody here who can live the Christian life in his own flesh, in his own strength. I've said before, the Christian life isn't hard. It's not difficult. It's impossible. Now he's going to talk about the false message. And what is the false message? Notice in verse 6, I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him that called you into the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another, but there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. One of the things we notice, first of all, is Paul says, whoever this is that's doing this to the Galatian believers is troubling them and perverting the gospel in the process. That's pretty serious. Don't do that. <laughs> but notice, Paul is astonished. He's shocked. He's overwhelmed that the Galatians, who've only been Christians for a short time, have so quickly turned away from the simplicity of their faith. And at this place in all of Paul's letters, <laughs> this is interesting, in this place, in all of Paul's letters, right here in the first part of the chapter of chapter 1, there's a prayer. There is no prayer in this letter. Paul is not in the praying mood. <laughs> Have you ever had people do this? You're having a discussion with a spiritual brother or sister, and it gets really difficult, and they're not really dealing with the truth, and so they say, you know, why don't we pray? <laughs> I've actually said this, no, we're not going to pray. This is no time for prayer. We're going to deal with this issue, then we'll pray. And Paul is saying, this is no time for prayer. He's not going to pray about this. Paul is upset. 
and he's not going to pray. He accuses his readers of being turncoats. He says, how could you so quickly turn away from the purity of the gospel which was given to you? And this word turn away is the word which really means a military revolt and a change of attitude. The apostle thinks of the readers as having changed sides. You have become Christians and now you're going back to the old way. And these are tough words, these are grave words. The Galatians were not just exchanging one set of opinions for another set of opinions. No, they were not merely preferring one acceptable way to another acceptable way. Paul makes it clear that by leaving the grace of God, they have left God himself. And the seriousness of this erosion is observable in two words that Paul uses. And I don't like to get into all this Greek stuff because I'm not trying to impress you, but these two words are really important. The first word is this. Notice in your Bible, he says, you have turned to a different gospel. Underline different in your Bible. You know what the word is in the language of the New Testament? It's the word heteros. And we would know that meaning because we talk about somebody who is heterosexual. What does that mean? They're interested in the opposite sex. What Paul is saying is here, you have turned to a heteros gospel. It's not the same gospel. It's a different gospel. It's not even the real gospel. He's saying you haven't changed from one gospel that's acceptable to God to another gospel that's acceptable to God. No, 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 no. You've given up the real gospel for a different gospel. And then he uses another word, alas, which isn't even the same. <laughs> this isn't even the same. This is not a gospel. Ladies and gentlemen, when you corrupt the simplicity of the grace of God in the gospel, you do away with the gospel. It isn't the gospel anymore. You can't do that. And if it isn't the gospel, it can't save anybody. <laughs> if there's anything I could do to merit the grace of God, then it isn't the grace of God. If there's anything I could do to be acceptable to God, do you think he would have sent his own son into this world to die on my behalf? I don't think so. The reason he came is because I'm incapable of reaching up to God in my own strength. I have nothing to give him. The Bible says even my righteousnesses are as filthy rags. My hands are empty. And all I can do with empty hands is receive what God has already done. That's God's grace. And when somebody comes along and tries to add something to the gospel, Paul understands that to be a serious violation that should not be just winked at and let go. According to the apostle, there is no compromise. It's either the gospel of grace or it is not the gospel at all. Now, he comes finally to the false messenger. And in verses 8 and 9, here's what Paul says. As if his words had not already been strong enough. Verse 8, he says, but even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. Whoa. I'm telling you, this is a little violent. <laughs> In fact, an angel from heaven is the highest created authority. Even an angel cannot defy the authority of God and preach a gospel that does not originate with God. Paul says that if a man or an angel should dare to do such a thing, he is anathema. That's the word. Accursed. If someone should stand in this pulpit someday and teach a gospel that is not the gospel of grace, God puts his stamp of curse on that person. He is selected for damnation. That's what it means. You say, whoa, pastor, that's strong. He surely didn't mean it. Well, yes, he did. He did mean it because he said it again in the next verse. In case we didn't get it. Verse 9, as we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you than what you have received, let him be accursed. Why would Paul repeat himself? Well, for one thing, sure would leave an impression on the people who were reading it. <laughs> Remove any doubt that maybe he had miswritten or misspoken. No, Paul wants us to understand this is not an optional thing we should concern ourselves about. This is a serious issue. Don't mess with the gospel. Perhaps you're thinking, well, aren't Paul's words a little severe? I mean, in our age of tolerance and easygoing religion, Paul's words are really harsh. We have been conditioned in our culture to accept anything. I mean, that's the standard deal. The thing that we want now more than anything else is to be tolerant, 
politically correct, never say anything. I mean, even in our government, we're taking out all the words that might offend anyone. And John Stott said what that represents is what is going on today. It's called syncretism. Syncretism is bringing everything together from all of the various things and making it all one. Take a piece of this and a piece of that and mix and match a little of this. Take some of the scientists, take some of their stuff and take some of the stuff from the Old Testament. And that's where a lot of people are today. They're collecting things and here's what they say. I'm gonna get all this stuff and collect it all and I'm gonna make my own religion. Well, my friend, if you make your own religion, you're gonna have to make your own heaven because you aren't going there. Because you can't get to heaven in your own religion. Whoever taught you that you get to make the rules? Almighty God is your creator. He set the rules out. Teaches that every one of us will be alive somewhere forever and ever and ever. The soul that God gave you when he created you is a deathless, eternal soul. Its value is so great, this soul. It's so great that Jesus Christ himself, the second person of the Godhead, came from the mansions of glory to this sick, sad world to pay the price of our redemption. And he had to give his own life as a ransom for our souls. He died on Calvary's cross to the jeers and the sneers of the mocking multitude. He who knew no sin became sin for us because of the value of the soul. As far as God is concerned, to tamper with so great a salvation is to tamper with the eternal destiny of a human soul. Now maybe we can understand a little bit why Paul was so angry about what these people were doing. The Bible says when we were without strength, Christ died for us. Our only hope is grace and grace alone. Our only hope is that Almighty God would reach down into the pit where we are and by his wonderful grace pull us up out of our situation, which he did because of the cross of Jesus Christ. Our only hope. And when people play with the content of the grace of God, they play with the only hope of the world. Which is why we shouldn't be quite so tolerant sometimes as we are. And maybe a little bit more strident than we are to say, no, that's the glorious, wonderful gospel of God's grace. You leave it alone. It belongs to God. And it's the only hope of the world. And my friend, it's not just the only hope of the world. It's the only hope for any of us in this room. One of the reasons why so many people, and especially is this true of men, so many men struggle with the gospel is because, and I've actually heard them say to me, Pastor Jeremiah, I believe your gospel. It's just too easy, too simple. Tell me something I can do. Tell me something I can do, and then I'll believe your gospel. But there isn't anything you can do. If there was anything any of us could do, Jesus Christ wouldn't have come down here. He came down here because we were at the bottom of the well, and we couldn't get out. And he sent Jesus down here to rescue us. What a great story. What a great, wonderful truth. One day I was at the bottom of the well and Jesus rescued me. How many of you have been rescued here today? Say, I've been rescued. I've been rescued. Amen. And until we come to the place where we understand our helplessness apart from the grace of God, we can't be saved. Because until we understand that, we keep trying to give God something. We keep, Lord, I go to church a lot, God. <laughs> I'm a good husband, God. I work hard, man. I've made a good living and provided. For... Those are all great things, but they have nothing to do with you going to heaven. Until you come to the place the Bible says as a little child and say, Lord, and she said, I quit. I can't do it. I'll never be able to do it. And I said, do what? She said, do the Christian life. That's what. After what I heard last night, she said, I know I will never be able to live the Christian life. There is no sense even trying. I'm turning in my Bible, pastor. I quit. Well, that actually took place several years ago during a crusade that was held in our church when I was a pastor in Fort Wayne, Indiana. On the night to which this woman referred, the crusade team had decided to distribute a sheet of paper to everyone who was present. And on the sheet of paper, they had listed all the sins of the flesh, plus a few other evil practices, which certainly would have gotten the attention of any young follower of Christ trying to get started living the Christian life. 
I don't remember all the items that were on the list, but I do recall that there was a place to evaluate how much time you had prayed the previous week, how much time you had spent reading the Bible, how many people you had witnessed to. I remember that I felt defeated and I was the pastor of the church. <laughs> and I found out later that some of the people who presented the list were also overwhelmed by the implications of it. It took us weeks to bring that woman back to a wholesome outlook on the Christian life. We had taught her at the beginning that Christianity was a relationship with Jesus Christ, not a bunch of rules to be followed. But that night in that crusade had almost convinced her that she was now responsible for her own standing before God. And while this event took place all those years ago, it has been replayed for me in one form or another many times since. For some reason, man has an incurable desire to replace the wonderful grace of Jesus with some rules and regulations. Jerry Bridges spoke for many Christians when he wrote, My observation of Christendom is that most of us tend to base our relationship with God on our performance instead of on his grace. In this sense, we live by works rather than grace. We are saved by grace, but we are living by the sweat of our own performance. End of quote. And writer Dudley Hall says, more often than not, what is proclaimed as gospel is just another challenge to do better. Try harder, pray longer, be more committed, love deeper, stop sinning, be good, be happy. No wonder the church has failed to connect with so many people out there. The hurting masses of the world are seeking a cure for their ills and solutions for their problems. And too often the church has just given them more expectations to fulfill, more rules to keep, more activities to maintain, more work to do, and the result has been a trail of disillusionment and discouragement. Eugene Peterson, who has given us the paraphrase called The Message, wrote a book once called Traveling Light, and in this book he said, we might fairly suppose that a congregation of Christians well stocked with freedom stories, like the stories of Abraham, Moses, David, Samson, Deborah, and Daniel would not for a moment accept any teaching that would suppress freedom. We might reasonably expect that a group of people who from their earliest days have been told stories of Jesus setting people free and who keep Jesus at the center of their lives in weekly worship would be sensitive to any encroachment of their freedom. That these people would be critically alert to anyone or anything that would suppress their newly acquired spontaneity. But he goes on to say, in fact, in the community of faith, the very place where we actually experience the free life for the first time, if we're not careful, we are in most danger of losing it in the very same place. Paul's letter to the Galatian believers is proof that this problem, which plagues so many of today's Christians, is as old as the first century church. Many of you, like me, perhaps grew up in a church where you were considered to be a good Christian based upon your ability to live up to a certain number of things. And I don't have to give you what they are. They were different for everyone. But you were judged on the basis of your ability to do certain things and often not do certain other things. We call that legalism because it's a return to the law. Well, the Galatian letter was written to a group of Christians who were about ready to return to the bondage of the law. Let me tell you their story quickly. Had it not been for Paul's intervention in their lives through this letter called Galatians, many of them would have gone back to a dreary, dull legalism lived at its lowest level. You see, many Gentiles had come to be Christians during the time that Paul was preaching. Toward the end of his preaching career, Paul was reaching hundreds and hundreds of Gentiles with the gospel. But just as these Gentile Christians were getting established in the freedom of their faith, some teachers that Paul refers to as Judaizers in this text came from Jerusalem and began to teach these Gentiles that their faith wasn't complete unless it was accompanied by the law. In other words, they said, you want to believe in Jesus Christ, that's fine. 
But you can't have full salvation unless you add to it the observance of the Old Testament law. And especially at stake was the practice of circumcision, which was the Jewish rite. So they were trying to tell the Gentiles that really in order for them to be Christians, they had to be Jews too. And the attack was powerful against these new believers. It wasn't really original, but it was powerful. You know, from the very beginning, there always have been attacks on the gospel. Let me tell you how they come. They come in two different ways. First of all, sometimes people come and they try to subtract stuff from the gospel. Have you noticed? Well, I believe in the gospel. I just don't believe in the deity of Jesus. How do you do that? Oh, yes, I believe in the gospel, but I don't accept the Bible as the authoritative word of God. It's full of errors and it's not true. My friends, you can't do that. You can't take the gospel and pull out of it the stuff you don't like and still have the gospel. What you got is nothing. And over the years, when people start to denigrate the deity of Christ, we stand up against it. We teach against it. But the new thing in the world today is not the subtraction from the gospel. It's the addition to the gospel. The new thing is to take the gospel, leave it as it is, but add more stuff to it. Like... If you're not baptized, you can't be a Christian. You, I don't know, we believe in baptism here. We baptize somebody in almost every service, but we don't baptize them so that they can become Christians. We baptize them because they already are Christians. And baptism is a picture of what has already happened to them. Let me say this clearly. You don't have to be baptized to go to heaven. And I know that for a fact because the thief on the cross went right into the presence of the Lord and they didn't have time to baptize him. So baptism is an ordinance, but it's not a work of grace. Some people say, well, you can't have the gospel if you don't have the Eucharist. Well, the Eucharist may be all right, but it's not the gospel. Communion's not the gospel. The law's not the gospel. I have a friend, a very good friend, very knowledgeable friend, who said something to me the other day. I was telling you about a book I had read written by a man who has gotten a hold of the importance of compassion in the community. And he's been giving lessons on how to deal in your community, all which is well and good. But my friend was telling me about this book, and he was so excited about it. And he kept saying this over and over again. He kept saying, you know what's so good about that, Dr. J, is it's the gospel. It's the gospel. It's not the gospel. Giving food to the hungry is not the gospel. Helping people who are poor is important as it is. It is not the gospel. It is the result of the gospel at work in your life. But it isn't the gospel. And friends, when we start tampering with the gospel, we do great damage to the cause of Christ. Let's get this clear, that the gospel isn't anything other than what the Bible says it is. And Paul's going to deal with that here in this passage of Scripture. Now he begins where he had to begin because one of the things that was happening to him as this book starts is that people had begun to criticize Paul. They didn't have anything good to say that they could use against the message of grace and they didn't like Paul so they said well you can't trust Paul he's not even a real apostle. He was born after the other apostles were gone. He's not one of the twelve. And so listen how Paul begins the letter. He says, Paul, an apostle, not from men or through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. Paul has to go after this accusation against him that he's not a real apostle because here, they're not trying to discredit him as an apostle for any other reason than to be able to discredit his message. If Paul is an apostle, then he can say what he says. But if he's not, then you don't have to believe anything that he's taught. So they went after Paul's apostleship. And Paul begins this letter by dealing with the fact that he is a true messenger of God. He is an apostle not from men or through men, but through Jesus Christ. His defense of his apostleship isn't a matter of pride. He's not trying to say, well, I'm an apostle. No, his defense is born out of a deep concern for the gospel which he preached. In other words, if he is not God's apostle, then the Galatians can disregard anything he might say. So from the outset, Paul wants it understood that as a true messenger, his gospel is not from men, but it's from God. And of course, it was true that Paul wasn't one of the twelve. But his call was just as real as theirs had been. In 1 Corinthians 15, he says, And last of all, 
he was seen by me, Paul's writing, me also, as one born out of due time. For I am the least of the apostles who am not worthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of Christ. What is Paul saying? Am I not an apostle? Absolutely. Did he see Christ? That was one of the requirements. When did he see him? On the road to Damascus, he saw Christ. After all of the rest, he was born out of due time. One of the other requirements for an apostle was they had to have received a message directly from God. Did Paul receive such a message? Look at verse 11. But I make known to you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man. Where did he get it? He got it from God. Paul was an apostle. He was a legitimate apostle of Jesus Christ. Now probably you've noticed that some people today say they're apostles. And if by their claim they mean that they are sent ones, which is what the word means, then that's okay. But if they think they are apostles, like the same apostles in the New Testament, they are certainly in error. Because according to the New Testament, you cannot be an apostle unless you saw the risen Lord, unless you accompanied Jesus from his baptism to his resurrection. Nobody today can say that. But Paul said it, and it was true of Paul, out of due time, had every right to say what he was about to say. Now, Paul is defending his own legitimacy, his own credibility. For if he is not credible, then the rest of this is meaningless. We now understand that Paul accepts his apostleship from God, not from men. He is appointed by God as an apostle. And so he moves from his defense of the true messenger to talk about the true message. And here's what he says about the true message of the gospel. Grace to you and peace from God, verse 3 our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Now that he has dealt with his own credibility, Paul turns his attention to the content of the message of the gospel. By the way, you can't see my Bible, but it's all marked up in this first chapter. One of the reasons is this is all about the gospel. The word gospel is in the first 11 verses five times. Paul is talking about the gospel and what it really is. And he wants us to understand the nature of it. And now he's going to define it in these verses. And what does he say about the gospel? He said, first of all, it is the voluntary death of Christ on the cross for our sin. By his own will, he says, he went to the cross. How many of you know Jesus didn't go to the cross because he was made to go to the cross? He went to the cross of his own will. When he came into this world, he prayed this prayer. He said, Lord, in the volume of the book it is written, I have come to do your will. He went to the cross as the will of the Father by his own volition. Paul says the first thing to remember about the gospel, it is the voluntary death of Christ on the cross. And then it says it's the vicarious death of Christ. The word vicarious means to do something in behalf of another person, to do something in someone else's place. Paul says that he died, Christ died for our sins, for yours and for mine. He died in the place where we deserve to die. He was our vicarious substitute on the cross. His death is voluntary, his death is vicarious, and thirdly, it's victorious. Notice what he says happens when he dies for us. He delivers us from the evil age in which we live. We have been delivered because of what Jesus did on the cross. That's the gospel. If you go back to verse 1, it involves the resurrection. God the Father who raised him from the dead. So what is the gospel class? It's simply this. Christ died. Christ was buried, Christ rose again, his death was in our behalf as the Son of God. It was the propitiation for all the sin of the world. And whoever will put their trust in what Jesus did on the cross will become a Christian. That's what it means to be a Christian. That's the gospel. Not anything added to it, not anything subtracted from it. It's the pure gospel of the grace of God. Now, since Christ has done all of this for us, since he voluntarily has given himself for us, taking our place in death, rescuing us out of this evil age, how presumptuous it must seem to him, to God, when we try to add something human into what he's already done. It's like we're saying, God, thank you for the gospel, but it's not quite enough. Thank you for the gospel, but I'm not going to be able to accept this gospel unless I can add something to it from myself. 
The gospel is either God's gospel or it's no gospel. And Paul is saying, you can't say to these new Galatian believers, you have been saved by the grace of God and the gospel is sufficient for you. Oh, but you need the law too. And it was the very thing that they were doing that so angered Paul. I need to tell you, we're going to find this out before we're done. This is a violent passage of scripture. I mean, Paul is exercised in this passage of scripture, more so than you've ever seen your pastor exercised in this pulpit. To put it mildly, the boy's upset. <laughs> and he's upset for a legitimate reason. It's because the Gentile churches were being taught that what Jesus did through his death on the cross was not enough. It may have been adequate for their initial salvation, but they needed something more in order to maintain their Christian life. Paul says something, turning your Bibles over to the third chapter. We, I just want to read the first three verses of the third chapter. Listen how Paul deals with this. He says, listen, he says, O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth? Now watch this, before whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed among you as crucified. This only, he says, here's the question I want to ask you. Listen up. He said, I just want to know this. Did you read by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Are you so foolish, having begun in the spirit, that you can now be made perfect in the flesh? You who think, I'm saved by grace, but I got to keep myself saved and walking with God by my own works. Paul said, are you so foolish to think that you can keep yourself in a situation you can never get yourself into in the first place? How foolish is that? You cannot be saved without the grace of God and you cannot live the Christian life without the grace of God. There's nobody here who can live the Christian life in his own flesh, in his own strength. I've said before, the Christian life isn't hard. It's not difficult. It's impossible. Can I get a witness? <laughs> It's impossible. And the impossibility of it means that only Jesus Christ living his life in you or in me can make the Christian life work. It is not by adding some regulations and some rules. And this is the way I grew up. I grew up with the rules and the regulations. Here's the problem with that. I knew a lot of people that kept all the rules. They didn't smoke, they didn't chew, they didn't go with girls who do. I mean, that's how they work, you know? <laughs> They kept all the law. I mean, they didn't violate the filthy five, the nasty nine, or the dirty dozen. I want to tell you something. They kept them all. And some of them were mean people. They kept all the rules, and they weren't nice. I mean, as a young person growing up, I would look at that and say, you know what? If keeping all the rules makes you like them, forget it. Let's go break some, you know? What's wrong with that? It's the idea that somehow externally you can become what you were only made to be from the inside out through the grace of God. You can offers to me in its place his righteousness. Now, friends, if that isn't grace, I don't know what it is. And his grace is available to you as well. Whoever you may be, whatever you may have done, how far you may feel, you are away from God. God loves you. He sent his son to die for you. He wants you to be with him forever in heaven. But you've got to come to the place where you're willing to say yes to him. I accept what you did for me. I acknowledge I have sinned. And I receive Jesus Christ remedy for that sin. And I receive him as my savior. Do that today. You don't need me to take you any further step by step. Just do it in your heart. You know it's right. You can begin a new life as you listen to this program. If you're a Christian and a part of the support of this ministry, as you know, this is an important month. We need your help to say thank you for your gift during this final month of the fiscal year. We want to send you a copy of this impressive book, Living the 66 Books of the Bible. Practical application for every book of the Bible. It's 287 pages. It's hardback. It's beautiful. And it's motivating, and you'll want to have a part in what the message is. On August the 21st, 2015, two American service members, Spencer Stone and Alec Scarlatis, and their friend Anthony Sadler, boarded a train in Amsterdam headed to Brussels. 
having time off from their military duties, they wanted to do some sightseeing. And unknown to them, a 25-year-old Moroccan terrorist had boarded the train and was situated in car number 12, armed with an AK-47 assault rifle, a 9mm pistol, a box cutter, and 270 rounds of ammunition. He was planning a spectacular terrorist attack during which he wanted to massacre all the passengers on the train and grab the attention of the world. When the Americans heard gunshots and the breaking of glass, the three of them sprang into action. Scarlatus, who had been napping, came to life and instinctively shouted, Go! And the three young men attacked the terrorist, tackling him, disarming him, and rendering him unconscious with the butt of his own rifle. Stone was stabbed with the box cutter, but his injuries were not life-threatening. And using emergency first aid skills, the three tended to the wounded. Now that story flashed around the world. I remember when that happened. I remember seeing it on the news. And the young Americans were hailed as heroes for stopping what could have been one of the worst massacres since 9-11. As you probably remember, Clint Eastwood made a movie about that event and asked the three young men to portray themselves in the film. Here's what you may not know. The three young men first met as students at a Christian school in Sacramento, and their faith played a role in their lives. They felt the Lord had prepared them and placed them on that train for such a time as that. Scarlatus later told a journalist, if you look at the odds of everything that happened and how close we came to dying on so many different occasions, it's too coincidental. It was too astronomical for it just to be chance. It had to be God looking out for us. Since then, several other details have come to light. Though the three young men had known each other in high school, their lives had gone in three different directions. They found themselves together again on that trip to Paris for the first time. The three decided to leave Amsterdam a day earlier than they had originally planned. At the last minute, they decided to switch from coach to first class, which is where the attack took place. Stone had training in two skills that proved critical that day, jiu-jitsu and advanced first aid. Also, remarkably, the terrorist AK-47 misfired, which allowed the three to subdue him. And the problem wasn't with the rifle, but with a faulty bullet, which almost never, ever happens. Stone later said that he had never felt calmer in his life than at the moment the terrorist aimed his rifle at him and pulled the trigger. Nothing happened due to that faulty bullet, and the terrorist was tackled. Another unexpected fact was that the terrorist dropped his handgun magazine just before reaching the three young men. We know this series of events weren't coincidences, said Sadler, whose father is a Baptist preacher. It's like our lives were leading up to that moment. You don't always know what plan God has for you. What we've come to realize with hindsight is that this was all part of his plan. A bigger picture. That's where we were supposed to be that day. In hindsight, looking back on our lives, it looks like we were all preparing our whole lifetime for that moment. There's no denying it. I don't know if he realized it or not, but that young man perfectly summarized the story of the book of Esther. As you look at the Old Testament heroes who overcame great difficulties and prevailed in the name of the Lord, you're struck by the theme of the life of Esther. The events that unfolded in this book called Esther were not coincidence. It is as though Esther's whole life had been leading up to these crucial days. Portrayed in this story and in the hindsight, we can see that it was all part of a plan, a bigger picture. Her entire life had been in preparation for the events that transpired. There's no denying it. And there's no denying that the sovereign providential oversight of God is still at work, not only in our world and in the unfolding history of our planet, but also in our own lives and in the unfolding of our days. You may think you came here tonight for one reason or the other, but let me tell you what I know. You're here tonight because God wants you to be here. You're here in the plan of God. 
The Lord wants you and I to overcome the circumstances that come to pass in our lives, and he brings us together in events like this to encourage us to do just that. That's the way the book of Esther opens, with five words. Have you ever noticed it? Here's what it says. Now it came to pass. Someone once told me those are the five most encouraging words in the Bible. When something happens to you that's really bad, don't be upset. Just say, it came to pass. It didn't come to stay. It came to pass. <laughs> in the book of Esther, we learn some lessons about God's sovereign control in our lives. And I want to share them with you tonight, sort of one at a time, as I tell the story. And I'm going to preach the whole book of Esther in about 30 minutes. First of all, we learn from the book of Esther that God ordains his purpose. This is the writer's subtle way of introducing a story in which a remarkable set of events came to pass under the sovereignty of Almighty God. The book of Esther is very unique in the scripture, men and women, because it's the only book in the Bible that does not mention God by name. And yet, the hidden hand of God is in every chapter and almost every verse. It's almost like God gave us the book of Esther to teach us that even when we are not able to visibly or obviously see him, he's still among us. He's still there watching over us and ordaining his purposes. Look at how the book begins in the first chapter. Now it came to pass when King Ahasuerus sat on the throne of his kingdom, which was in Shushan, the citadel, that in the third year of his reign he made a feast for all of his officials and servants, the powers of Persian, Media, the nobles, the princes in the provinces being before him. This gives us the setting of how this happened, which is very important to the story. It's helpful to know some background to the book of Esther, so hang with me as I lay it out for us. The story of the Old Testament is a story of the nation of Judah and the city of Jerusalem. God had chosen the Jewish people, the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to be the channel through which the Redeemer, the Lord Jesus Christ, would be born. But as you know, as you study the Old Testament, the nation of Judah fell into sin and debauchery so, so awful and so rebellious against God that the Lord had to allow them to be captured by the Babylonians and carried away captive. The city was destroyed, the, the land was invaded, many of the people died, the temple was razed to the ground, and many survivors went into exile. Seventy years go by, long years, and then in the keeping of the predictions of the prophet Jeremiah, this empire, the Babylonians, were overthrown by the Persians, and the king of Persia, a man by the name of Cyrus, became friendly toward the Jewish people. He kept the prediction of Isaiah who said this very thing would happen. He issued a decree and allowed some of the Jews to go back to Jerusalem to rebuild their city and rebuild their temple. One of the big surprises when you study history is you would think after being in captivity for 70 years, they would all rush out the door to get back home. But only a very small percentage of them went back to Jerusalem. Some of them stayed in Persia, some of them dispersed to the other places. Some of the Jews returned, but most of them remained in the part of the world we know as Persia. And the capital of that part of the world is a place called Shushan. And as you read the first verses of the book of Esther, it says, these events took place in Shushan. That was the capital, and that's the beginning of the story of Esther. The reigning king of that part of the country was a guy whose name was Ahasuerus. And in chapter 1, we are told that he threw a party for all of his royal officials and military leaders. And the alcohol flowed freely, and the food came in gluttonous abundance. And at one point, the king called for his beautiful wife, a woman named Vashti, to entertain the men with her beauty. She had the good sense to refuse him because the event was becoming a drunken orgy. And when she refused her husband in front of all of his friends, he felt humiliated and he was furious. And in one moment, he deposed his queen and declared the seat of the queen unoccupied. Vashti was history. 
He didn't realize at the time that Almighty God was allowing this to happen. God had this young Jewish woman he wanted on the throne for a crucial period of time, and he was ordaining his purposes through the unfolding of the palace intrigue. Let me tell you something tonight, men and women. God has a plan for history. Sometimes when we look at what goes on in our nation and in our nation's capital, we wonder maybe God has gone on vacation, but he has not. And his plan involves the first and the second comings of Christ, and it involves you and me, and it involves his church. It is the most fascinating blueprint you could ever imagine. And I've spent much of my life studying and preaching about it in terms of biblical history and biblical prophecy. Right now, as we live tonight, we are in between biblical history and biblical prophecy. It's a very interesting place to be, isn't it not? And that's the core message of Esther. God has ordained his plans, and they will surely unfold on his timetable. All that stuff about Vashti being deposed, the whole party, the drunken orgy, how could that be a part of God's plan? God takes what happens and incorporates it into his plan. And the Bible says all things work together for good to those who are the called according to his purpose. God ordains his purposes. Here's the second lesson we learned from Esther. God orchestrates his people. That brings us to chapter 2 of the story, where we learn that God not only ordains his plans, he orchestrates his people. After King Ahasuerus deposed his beautiful wife, Queen Vashti, for her insubordination, he had to replace her. So they had a summons that went throughout the kingdom for beautiful women to apply for the job, so to speak. And there was this girl, a Jewish girl, an orphan, named Esther, whom God had providentially placed in the capital city at that very time. She had been raised by her cousin Mordecai. Look at Esther chapter 2, verses 5 through 7. In Shushan, the citadel, there was a certain Jew whose name was Mordecai. And Mordecai had brought up Hadassah, that is Esther, his uncle's daughter, for she had neither father or mother, and the young woman was lovely and beautiful and when her father and mother died, Mordecai took her as his own daughter. As unlikely as it seems in the story, this Jewish young woman was selected by Ahasuerus to become the new queen of the land. And verse 17 says, The king loved Esther more than all the other women, and she obtained grace and favor in his sight more than all the virgins. So he set the royal crown upon her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. And the plot thickens. Now there's this interesting little detail at the end of chapter 2. And for all of you here tonight who think the intrigue in our current government is hard to explain, let me tell you something. Nothing's really changed very much. While all this pomp and circumstance was going on with the installation of the new queen, some deadly palace intrigue was happening behind the scenes. A plot was afoot to assassinate the king, but who should happen to hear about it but Mordecai? And now he had somebody in the capital, so he passed the information along to his new queen, and she told the king's bodyguards, and the plot was thwarted. Now that doesn't seem like an important part of the story, but hold that for a bit later. Hold it over here in this compartment of your mind. All of this was God's providence shaking itself out through the circumstances because as we come to chapter 3, we encounter one of the most evil men in the Bible, a man by the name of Haman. After these things, King Ahasuerus promoted Haman and advanced him and set his seat above all the princes who were with him. And all the king's servants who were within the king's gate bowed and paid homage to Haman. For so the king had commanded concerning him. But Mordecai would not bow or pay homage. Uh-oh. Mordecai, who was a sterling judge of character, knew Haman was nothing but trouble. And he refused to honor him. And when Haman discovered Mordecai was a Jew, he determined not only to destroy Mordecai, but to annihilate all the Jews from the face of the earth wherever they were dispersed. Anti-Semitism is very old, men and women, all the way back to Moses and the babies that were killed by Pharaoh. Haman was a prideful, ruthless man, and his offended pride erupted in silent, white-hot fury. 
There's no wrath like the quiet, scheming fury of a person whose pride has been offended. Verses 8 and 9, we read that Haman went to King Ahasuerus, and this is the story he told him. He's, he's setting this up. There's a certain people scattered and dispersed among the people in all the provinces of your kingdom. Their laws are different from all other peoples, and they do not keep the king's laws. Therefore, it is not fitting for the king to let them remain. So if it pleases the king, let a decree be written that they be destroyed. Now, obviously, King Ahasuerus wasn't at home that day, mentally. He wasn't thinking. And so we are told that letters were sent by the couriers into all the king's provinces to destroy, to kill, and annihilate all the Jews, both young and old, little children and women, in one day. Verse 15 of chapter 3, the couriers went out, hastened by the king's command, and the decree was proclaimed in Shushan, the citadel. So the king and Haman sat down to drink, and the city of Shushan was perplexed. And when Mordecai heard about the decree in chapter 4, he was totally distraught. The scripture says he tore his clothes, he put on sackcloth and ashes, he cried with loud and bitter cries. His nation was about to be annihilated, and he approached the palace that way. And when Queen Esther saw him and heard about it, she was confused and embarrassed. She had really not yet grasped the seriousness of the situation, and she sent fresh clothes to Mordecai, like that's going to help him. But he refused to wear them. He sent word to her about the crisis they faced, and he begged for her help. At first, Esther hesitated, even though she was the queen. She just couldn't walk into the king's presence because there was a law that you couldn't go into the king's presence unless you were invited. And if you did, it could cost you your life. But Mordecai's answer has echoed down through the ages as one of the greatest statements ever spoken regarding the sovereign providence of God. Esther 4, 13 and 14, listen to these words. And Mordecai told them to answer Esther when she didn't want to get involved. Do not think in your heart that you will escape in the king's palace any more than all the other Jews. For if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place. But you and your father's house will perish. Listen to these words. Yet who knows? Who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. What a moment. She had come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Mordecai knew that it was not an accident that Esther had assumed the throne just when the Jews were facing existential attack. It was not a coincidence. It was not a matter of luck or chance or good fortune. It was not haphazard. God was moving the pieces on the chessboard God was making his move. God was in control, for he knows how to orchestrate his people. And Mordecai warned Esther that if she didn't assert herself in this crisis and do all in her power to help the Jews, help would come from some other place, but she and her family would perish. And he told her that she had come to the throne for such a time as this. Took courage, willingness, surrender. And Esther's reply never fails to move me. Look at verses 15 and 16 in the fourth chapter. Then Esther told them to reply to Mordecai, Go gather all the Jews who are present in Shushan and fast for me. Neither eat nor drink for three days, night or day. My maids and I will fast likewise. And so I will go to the king, which is against the law, and if I perish, I perish. Sometimes men and women, it comes to that, doesn't it? Sometimes it comes to the place where if we're going to follow God, we have to unfollow everybody else. Esther was faced with the greatest challenge of her life, a problem so enormous it could lead to the massacre of her entire nation. She said, in effect, I am willing to do whatever God tells me to do, and if I perish, I perish. There comes a time when you and I have to be overcomers to give everything over to the Lord, even when we don't know how it's going to turn out. We're willing to do what we can do. We obey what God tells us. We pray earnestly. And then in a sense, we let go and we let God and we have to say, Lord, here is my burden. Here's my problem. Here's my pain. Here's my work. Here's my opportunity. Here's my dream. I'm going to do my best, but I'm casting my care on you. And if I perish, I perish. Have you ever been in a place like that? 
I've been there maybe three times. And I want to tell you, you can trust God with such commitment. As we shall see in the book of Esther, when we give it all to God and we take our hands off the situation and say, Lord, I don't know how this is going to turn out. I don't know what you're up to, but I know what it is I'm supposed to do and I'm going to do it. And if I perish, I perish. There's something powerful about that. Somehow your life never is the same when you come to that place. God ordains his purposes and orchestrates his people. And finally, God orders his plans. God not only ordains his purposes and orchestrates his people, he orders his plans. In chapter 5, Queen Esther gained entrance into the throne room of King Ahasuerus and invited him to have a meal with her. She's now in the presence of the king and she survived. She wanted to prepare a set of banquets for the king. And she also asked the king to invite Haman. And when Haman received the invitation to the private banquet with the king and queen of Persia, his pride inflated like a balloon. His head got so big he couldn't put on his hat. Listen to Esther 5. I love this. So Haman went out that day joyful and with a glad heart. But when Haman saw Mordecai in the king's gate and that he did not stand or tremble before him, he was filled with indignation against Mordecai. Nevertheless, Haman restrained himself and went home and he sent and called for his friends and his wife Zeresh. He had this incredible wife, Zeresh. Then Haman told them of his great riches and the multitude of his children, everything in which the king had promoted him, how he had advanced him above the officials of the servants of the king. Moreover, Haman said, beside this, listen to this, you guys. He's kind of whispering this now. His voice is lower. Besides this, Queen Esther invited no one but me to come in with the king to the banquet she prepared. And tomorrow, I am again invited by her along with the king. Yet all that avails me nothing as long as I see Mordecai, the Jew, sitting in the king's gate. And then his wife, Zeresh, And all his friends said to him, Let a gallows be made fifty cubits high, and in the morning suggest to the king that Mordecai be hanged on it, and then go to the king's banquet. And the thing pleased Haman, so he had the gallows constructed. But watch the providence of God. That evening, King Ahasuerus could not sleep. He had a fit of insomnia. Have you ever had that? That night the king could not sleep, so one was commanded to bring the book of the records of the chronicles, and they were read before the king. And it was found written that Mordecai had told of Bagthana and Teresh, remember the two guys who tried to take out the king? Two of the king's eunuchs, the doorkeepers who had sought to lay hands on King Ahasuerus, and the king said, What honor or dignity has been bestowed on Mordecai for this? And the king's servants who attended him said, Nothing has been done. Now watch this. This was the assassination plot I mentioned earlier, and Mordecai had learned about it, and he had alerted the palace guard, thwarting the attack. And now on the night before Mordecai was to be hanged by the king, who had insomnia, didn't know what to do, so he called his attendants and he said, bring the chronicles, let me read the minutes of the last three or four weeks and see what we've been up to. And in the minutes of what had happened, he reads about this thing that had happened before. And he said, by the way, did we ever do anything for the person who saved my life? And he realized that Mordecai had never been rightfully thanked. By now the sun's coming up, and who should enter the palace at that very moment but Haman? And the king said in effect, there you are, Haman, let me ask you a question. Son, what should be done for someone I want to honor in a great way? And in his pride and arrogance, Haman thought the king was talking about him. If you're proud and arrogant, you think they're always talking about you. So he said, let's have us a great parade and clad the man in royal garb and put him on a royal horse and let's give the man a ticker tape parade through the middle of the city. And the king said, very good, go immediately, Haman, and find Mordecai and let's honor him. (laughs) Sing, yeah, right. Don't you just love that? I've told this story like four times in the last month, and all of us know the story, and we get to this part, everybody claps. 
and we think, finally, this guy's going to get what he deserves. Instead of hanging Mordecai, Haman sat him on a horse, clad him in royal robes, led him through the streets as a hero, and the celebrations took most of the day, and that evening, Haman was a wreck. And he goes home, and here's what happens. Afterward, Mordecai went back to the king's gate, but Haman hurried to his house, mourning and with his head covered. And Haman told his wife Zeresh and all his friends everything that had happened to him. His wise men and, and his wife Zeresh said to him, listen to her counsel. If Mordecai before you have begun to fall is of Jewish descent, you will not prevail against him, but you will surely fall before him. How's that for some encouragement from your wife? Who puts you up to the whole thing in the first place? And while they were still talking with him, the king's eunuchs came and they hastened to bring Haman to the banquet which Esther had prepared. In the next chapter, Esther 7 is very dramatic. At a pivotal moment at the banquet, Queen Esther turned on Haman and accused him of seeking to destroy her and all her people. And when King Ahasuerus realized his right-hand man had been plotting to destroy his wife and her people, and well received by the multitude of his brethren, seeking the good of his people and speaking peace to all of his countrymen. The story of the book of Esther is of tremendous historical importance. And it's such a gripping story, we can hardly put it down. But the most crucial lesson is very personal for us tonight. We have a God who ordains his purposes, orchestrates his people, and orders his plans according to his good and perfect will. He has a plan for your life and for mine. And it is no accident that we are alive in this time and this place today. I remember years ago. Never thought I'd find love like this Never thought I'd be waiting Move your body, let your spirit soar